A listener note, Killer Psyche contains adult content and describes violent acts. This episode is not suitable for everyone. Lee Passmore was a middle-aged man who lived in Plano, Texas. He'd been suffering from chronic lower back pain for years when his doctor recommended that he see a new neurosurgeon in town. Passmore's pain radiated from his lower back down his legs, and he was very anxious to get the problem fixed. With the recommendation from his current doctor, Passmore felt he was in good hands. So, in December of 2011, when the neurosurgeon suggested spinal surgery to fix the problem, Passmore checked into the hospital, both relieved and very hopeful. He thought the surgery was going to leave him feeling better. Instead, the doctor who operated on him made it worse. After only a few minutes, it became clear to everyone in the operating room that the surgeon, Dr. Christopher Dunch was butchering Lee Passmore. There was so much blood in the incision area that the doctor assisting him later said it looked like, and I quote, Dr. Dunch was fishing in a pond at night. Another doctor in the operating room, Dr. Hoyle, demanded that Dunch step aside and stop what he was doing. Dunch actually responded, I'm operating by feel, not by sight. Thankfully, Hoyle intervened anyway and stepped between Dunch and his patient, who by now was losing lots of blood. Hoyle was able to stop the bleeding and stabilize Passmore. But there was a problem. When Lee woke up in the intensive care unit, he felt like his back and legs were on fire. When his family came to visit, they could hear him screaming down the hall as they got off the elevator. The disc in his lower spine had been destroyed. Lee Passmore would never have feeling in his feet again. You may not have heard the name Christopher Dunch, but you may know him by his nickname, Dr. Death. The first time I heard about this case was when I learned of the butchery he exacted on Lee Passmore. But that wasn't even Dunch's most shocking outcome. After the Passmore tragedy, Dunch went on to botch more than 20 surgeries. Very few of his patients would be healed or even helped at all. Nearly every one of them would be left with permanent damage, and by damage, I mean chronic pain or a lasting disability. Two of them would die. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I'm a retired FBI criminal profiler and psychiatric nurse. My careers span over five decades. I've spent countless hours inside the minds of killers, criminals, and egomaniacs, like Christopher Dunch. Whenever somebody is caught doing something criminal or unimaginable, we ask ourselves why they did what they did. What were they thinking? But we rarely get a satisfying answer. On each episode of this series, I'm going to take you beyond the headlines and give you my assessment of what made them do it. This episode is Inside the Mind of Dr. Death. So what made Dunch do it? Is it possible that he intentionally harmed or even killed patients? Or was he so incompetent that he compulsively maimed and killed? Or was it because he was so damn arrogant refusing to see himself as flawed. In one rambling email to a girlfriend, he told her, I'm ready to become a cold-blooded killer. Or as Alec Baldwin's character says in the new TV series, Dr. Death on Peacock, he's either a sociopath or the most incompetent surgeon we've ever seen. Here are the facts. 
After graduating from medical school, where he obtained both a medical degree and doctorate, he completed a seven-year neurosurgery residency. He moved to Dallas and operated at a series of hospitals. And that in and of itself is unusual. For a surgeon to move from hospital to hospital so quickly is a red flag that there's a problem. In less than two years, out of only 38 surgeries, 33 patients ended up paralyzed or severely damaged, and two of them ended up dead. So knowing what we know now, let's look back and see what motivated Dunch. There are clues as to who Christopher Dunch became from simply looking at his early years. Stories from his friends and family help piece together how he got there and how and why it all went so wrong. What do we know about his early years? Dunch grew up in Memphis in a deeply religious home. His mom was a teacher, his dad was a physical therapist and a missionary. Dunch attended a private Christian academy and was accepted to college on a football scholarship. He wanted to be a big football star, a linebacker, the handsome football player who everyone admired and all the girls swooned over. He had his sights set on Division I. In the Dr. Death podcast, host Laura Beale revealed Chris's friends did not think he had the talent to play Division I. But he was very stubborn and would not take no for an answer. He would run the same football drill over and over unsuccessfully. The coach just tried to help him do it right, but he couldn't do it right. He actually thought if he worked hard enough, he'd be successful. Chris wasn't delusional in the clinical sense of the term, but he was very determined, and he apparently thought that physical perseverance would triumph over the need for skill and talent. Of course, it didn't. To say the least, Chris had a very well-defended ego. He never wanted to hear anything less than praise. When a friend was teasing him that he wasn't any good at wrestling, Dunch got in his car and drove over to his friend's house and challenged him to a wrestling match right there on the front lawn. And he lost. It seems to me that Chris took even the slightest criticism like a knife to the heart and would do anything to prove that the person that said it was wrong. But status and even the veneer of success was clearly important to him from a very young age. When he was cut from the football team, his dreams of becoming a football star faded away. He turned his attention to his fallback, becoming a doctor. But Chris was smart. You don't get into medical school just because you want to. He made it into a residency program for neurosurgery at the University of Tennessee Medical Center. But there were some bumps in the road. In the last year of his residency, he was sent to a rehab program. Fellow students saw him using cocaine before going in the operating room. And others saw him doing his morning rounds after an all-night bender. He was sent to a special treatment program for impaired physicians. He almost completed the entire rehab program, but they let him check out one day earlier than necessary. Why? Because had he completed the program, he would have had to report it on his record. He was able to return to his residency, complete it, and become licensed to practice medicine. It would be the beginning of a pattern. Those supervisors over him, letting him get away with things and not taking responsibility. As one nurse put it on the Dr. Death podcast, just kick the can down the road and let Dunch be somebody else's problem. Drug use, especially cocaine, was a constant part of Dunch's story for the rest of his career as a surgeon. From my experience, while Coke may not have made Dunch into the monster he became, it was quite probably a major contributor. And chronic cocaine abuse can lead to a range of long-term mood changes because it increases the stress hormone in your brain. For a lot of people, cocaine temporarily makes them feel invincible. It probably fed into his grandiosity. I'm a super doctor, a super surgeon, I can do anything it would have made him feel more confident in the operating room. He already had an overabundance of self-respect, and cocaine would have made that worse. 
For Dunch, abuse of cocaine would have increased his absurd sense of self-worth and narcissism to the moon. With or without Coke, he had some of the best doctors in Dallas telling him he was doing things wrong, yet he refused to hear it. What's important to point out here is perception versus reality, meaning just how differently Dunch saw himself versus how others saw him. Although he was calculating and clever, he thought he was smarter than everyone else, and people wouldn't notice his bad behavior. A narcissist thinks they can do and say anything, and others will believe it. He padded his resume with honors and credentials, and they were absurdly false. When he met a physician's assistant and started sleeping with her, he told her that the woman he'd moved down to Dallas with and was living in the same house was his secretary. In fact, she was his girlfriend and she was pregnant with his child. He was so convincing, the new girlfriend bought it. It appears to me he always saw himself as a person who should be worshipped by everyone else. By the way, a hallmark characteristic of a narcissist is they crave attention. A narcissist can be knee-deep in a serious problem they created and tell you everything's fine and they don't need any help. They're not crazy. They simply tell you what they want you to believe. So Christopher Dunch arrives in Dallas in 2011 and is a highly paid surgeon with glowing credentials from his neurosurgery residency program. He's already been to rehab for abuse of coke and alcohol. He goes into practice and starts operating at Baylor Regional Medical Center in Plano, Texas, a very well-known hospital in that area. Even though Dunch tried to keep up a good front, the cracks were beginning to show almost immediately. He was perceived not only as arrogant, but grossly inept as a surgeon. His first medical partners in Dallas at one point were trying to find him to follow up with the patient he'd performed surgery on that day. He was nowhere to be seen. They eventually found out he was in Las Vegas, and he hadn't alerted anyone where he was going or made arrangements for another doctor to check on the post-operative patient. But then the real tragedy started to mount. One patient came in for spinal surgery and left with bone fragments in his spinal canal. He left a sponge in a patient's neck and cut the guy's esophagus. In another patient, he punctured holes in the trachea and pinned her esophagus behind a plate near her spine. She was put on a feeding tube for weeks and she almost died. And then he operated on his closest friend, Jerry Summers. Dunch and Summers were friends from high school and reconnected when Dunch moved back to Memphis to attend medical school. They became thick as thieves. When Dunch moved to Dallas, Jerry came with him as a kind of a guy Friday, helping him set up his practice, driving him around, doing chores, pretty much doing whatever Dunch needed him to do. They even lived together. There was a bond there, a trust between them. So it wasn't that surprising that Dunch convinced Summers to have elective surgery on his neck to rid himself of pain from an old car accident. He explained that by fusing Jerry's neck vertebrae, he could get rid of the pain. The procedure was only supposed to take 90 minutes. But six hours in, it was determined that Dunch had removed too much of Jerry's neck muscles. And he'd severed his vertebral artery, Arteries carry blood. They're very important. If they're severed, only bad things can come of it. When Summers awoke in intensive care, he was paralyzed from the neck down. He would never walk again. I think that Jerry Summers' case gives us a real window into the mind of Christopher Dunch. Jerry idolized his friend, which probably only helped to inflate Dunch's ego. And no doubt in my mind that Dunch believed he deserved his friend's devotion. By all accounts, Jerry Summers was incredibly loyal to all his friends. He'd stick up for them in a fight and help them when they were in trouble. 
But with Dunch, it was very much a one-way street. I believe that Christopher Dunch is also a psychopath, and psychopaths only care about themselves and have no empathy for others. So when his debauchery in the OR turned his friend Jerry into a quadriplegic, he felt nothing, no sadness, no guilt, no anxiety, nothing. Dunch just didn't care. In fact, he never apologized to him. And Jerry supported his idol for years after the surgery that destroyed his life. Psychopaths also tend to lie a lot. Dunch lied about his education, his credentials, his surgical experience, his drug use. The list is long. Narcissistic psychopaths, which is what he was, are very manipulative. If they can get something in a straightforward manner, they'd rather go about it in a crooked manner. That's what manipulation is. Dunch manipulated his friends, his girlfriends, other medical professionals again and again. It was probably fun for him. After the Cherry summer surgery, Baylor Plano Hospital put him on a temporary restriction for one month. They told him he could perform minor outpatient surgeries while they investigated the summer surgery. And it's around that time that some former patients and other doctors were ringing pretty big alarms. They alerted both the hospital and the Texas Medical Board, and this was done by two prominent surgeons in Dallas who had observed how bad Dunch was, Dr. Robert Henderson and Dr. Randall Kirby. Here's a call that Dr. Henderson made to the head of Baylor when he later discovered Dunch's surgical tragedies. And then I heard he had problems at your hospital. Is that correct? He no longer has problems this year. I have to be very careful what I say to you. Right. I tell you what, um, I'm really uncomfortable talking about this, but we had a very similar procedure and we tried our very best to make sure that he didn't get privileges. I mean, this guy's a maniac and he's pathologic apparently. He, he talked his way out of apparently these issues at your hospital. His attorney called... No, he didn't. Let me just be clear, he did not. No, no, I mean, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, I'm trying to stop this guy from being let operate anywhere, anytime, any place. It sounds to me like Dr. Henderson, by using the word pathological, was flirting with the idea that perhaps Dunch was doing this on purpose. I agree with that completely. He kept operating on other patients, in other hospitals. It seemed like no matter how many red flags were raised, it was never enough to stop this guy. The question is, why not? As questions swirled about Dunch's qualifications and skills in the operating room, clues to his deteriorating mental state became more apparent. At his office in Plano was a nurse practitioner. He'd hired her to assist with surgeries as well as the office clerical work. Her name was Kimberly Morgan. And within a month of working for Dunch, the two were sleeping and partying together. She was spending all of her free time with them. Kimberly witnessed his ineptitude in the OR, but she never reported his behavior to higher-ups. She claimed he had an off sense of humor and that many people just simply didn't understand him. This may be why she didn't freak out when she received an email from him at four in the morning in December of 2011. In that email, Dunch called out how he abused drugs and alcohol and blamed it for their relationship fizzling out. He went on to say some pretty strange things to Kimberly. For example, this statement, anyone close to me thinks I'm likely something between God, Einstein, and the Antichrist because how I can do anything I want and cross every discipline boundary like it's a playground and never ever lose. That email shows what a narcissist Dunch is. That comparison is not just grandiose. And what I want to illustrate here is that his narcissism was extreme. Everything in life has a spectrum of intensity, and so do personality disorders. On one end, 
is the minor or insignificant, and the other is extremely intense, almost overwhelming. Narcissism can be minor, where the person is not so blinded by their own narcissism in order to perform a job effectively. However, Dunch does not fall into that category. He's way beyond that. And I think this next line from his email not only makes that point clear, but also really gives more insight into his mindset. I am ready to leave the love and kindness and goodness and patience that I mix with everything else that I am and become a cold-blooded killer. His downward spiral was clearly taking a sinister turn with thoughts like these, but if it weren't so shocking, it would be funny that he actually thinks he's kind and good and patient. At any rate, Kimberly Morgan might have thought he was just wasted or that he was incredibly high on coke when he wrote this, and he probably was. But when you put it in the larger context, it's impossible to ignore what he said. That statement he wrote is just one reason why I define Dunch as a malignant narcissist. And here's what I mean by that. Malignant is a term I use when the disorder is off the charts. This means dangerous and deadly. A malignant tumor is dangerous and deadly, and narcissism can be too. When a person's narcissistic personality disorder is so intense that it actually blinds them from any level of self-reflection, the disorder is malignant. And he compares himself to Einstein, God, and the Antichrist, all of them, in that email. This is malignant narcissism. There's no question of that. Dunch wrote long, rambling, self-aggrandizing emails quite a bit, but it doesn't matter if you think he literally meant it or not. That passage tells me everything I need to know about Christopher Dunch. He's more interested in titles and accolades than skill and talent. He can't accept his failures. Beyond not being able to say, I'm sorry, he blames the patient or staff around him for his inadequacies. Shockingly, Kimberly was in possession of those emails and she's a licensed healthcare professional. And were it to be discovered that she was doing cocaine, even on her own time, obviously, it would be bad for her. I think she had two good reasons not to go to the hospital authorities. Number one, she was protecting herself. And number two, she probably didn't want to get her boyfriend in trouble, even her former boyfriend. We don't know everything that went on in their relationship. We know some of it. What we know for sure is Christopher Dunch was a malignant narcissist and they are very skilled at getting other people to do what they want. And he certainly had reason to want her to remain silent. The first patient Dunch killed was a teacher named Kelly Martin. She came in for a very simple outpatient procedure to fix a compressed nerve. But during the surgery, Dunch severed one of her arteries and he didn't stop to fix it. And let me tell you, anyone who has taken a basic anatomy course can identify an artery. Arteries pulsate. They throb with every contraction of the heart. There are tiny arteries around a heart, but most of the other arteries in the body are much larger. It would be impossible to mistake it for anything else. And yet he severed it and kept on operating. She eventually bled out and passed away. The hospital appeared to be getting ready to fire him, but he beat them to the punch. He resigned. This allowed him to take advantage of a loophole in the system. If a doctor is fired, a hospital must report them to the National Practitioner Data Bank. However, if the doctor leaves on their own, a hospital does not have to say anything, which is exactly how only four months later, Dunch found himself back inside another operating room in the same city. In July of 2012, Dunch was hired at Dallas Medical Center as a neurosurgeon. Once again, they were impressed with his robust resume of scientific research and surgical experience. They granted Dunch temporary privileges at the hospital while they vetted his references and checked into his background. 
In just under one week of working at Dallas Medical Center, Dunch performed three surgeries. The first took a little longer than usual, but it went off without a hitch. His second patient was a woman named Floella Brown. Just like with the others, Dr. Dunch severed her vertebral artery, which caused massive bleeding. Massive bleeding resulted in a stroke, and she died the next day. Within 24 hours after the death of Floella Brown, Dr. Dunch was back in the operating room. His third patient that week was 74-year-old Mary Eford. She'd come in for spinal fusion surgery, and during the operation, Dunch severed one of the nerve roots in her spine. He was also operating on the wrong side of her back and left surgical hardware inside her. She survived, but was left paralyzed. It was the aftermath of this case that led the Texas Medical Board to finally begin looking more closely at Dunch. In the meantime, he continued to work at the other local hospitals and outpatient surgical centers. What this tells me, he wanted to hurt people. It was becoming something he felt compelled to keep on doing. He liked it. Dr. Robert Henderson, the doctor portrayed by Alec Baldwin in the new TV series, first encountered Dunch when he was called in to try and save Mary Eford, the 74-year-old woman who Dunch had left paralyzed in July of 2012. At first, Henderson thought Dunch must be some kind of imposter. How could a trained surgeon make so many blunders? He actually contacted the head of Dunch's surgery fellowship and faxed him a photo to make sure they were both talking about the same guy. So, was Dunch just grossly incompetent? Impaired by drugs? I'd say no. I would characterize his behavior and his thinking as criminal. I already described why I believe Christopher Dunch is a malignant narcissist. He's also a psychopath which many people confuse with sociopath. And if it seems like I'm piling on personality disorders here, it actually is not uncommon for someone to have more than one. And in Dunch's case, that is exactly what happened. So let me break it down for you. First of all, they come under the umbrella of antisocial personality disorder. You hear the word antisocial and you think it means they're a loner. No, what it means is they have a disregard for the laws, rules, regulations, norms, and mores of society. Those rules and laws don't apply to them. One of the hallmark characteristics of a psychopath is an inability to feel for others, to have empathy. And because of that, they do not feel bad about what they do if they hurt someone. They truly don't feel any guilt. Most of us hurt someone, we feel horrible. Both psychopaths and sociopaths share an inability to relate to others, to relate to the pain and suffering of others. So they don't feel guilt or shame. They also have an inability to love. Another characteristic, they don't learn from their mistakes. Oh, they may know intellectually, ooh, that didn't go well, I shouldn't do that again, but they'll do it again because they get something out of it. I'm often asked if a person is born with a personality disorder or is their behavior learned? Well, it's a mix of both. I call it a chink in the DNA armor or the genetic makeup of a person. They're born with it, but circumstances can cause it to flourish or remain under wraps. Here's an example. If a child is born with the gene for antisocial personality disorder, and they're raised in a home where they are neglected, abused, even witness violent acts, that's like watering the garden for a sociopath, and they could grow up to hurt or even kill people. There might have been warning signs in Dunch's youth. In the FBI or when I was a psychiatric nurse, 
When I spoke to parents or siblings regarding a problem child, I'd often recognize bad behavior in young people and how it can lead to destructive acts as an adult. It makes you wonder about Christopher, whether he was ever told no as a child. Now, this is just speculation, but it sounds like he wasn't listening to authority or believed he didn't need to. He could not listen to the coach's suggestions on the football field. I'm doing it my way, was his attitude. And of course, he did not improve. Being determined and persevering can be a positive thing. But if you completely deny reality, that pathological style of never giving up, when it crosses over into being unreasonable or delusional, there's a problem there. And by the way, most professionals in the field believe that if you scratch the surface of a grandiose narcissist, you'll find a massively insecure person. His narcissism clouded any thought that he might be a good surgeon or might not be. I believe that he knew he was not, but he was too narcissistic to admit that even to himself and even to his own detriment. So far, I've laid out why I think Christopher Dunch was not simply arrogant or negligent, and that my belief is he's not only an extreme narcissist, but also a psychopath. But I'm not done, because I believe he also showed signs of sadism. And what that means is he enjoyed the suffering of others. But for my FBI profiler training, I might not have seen that. As he said in his email, he was ready to become a cold-blooded killer. For a sadist, an operating room would be a playground. Think about it. If a surgeon is sadistic, he might think he could inflict pain and injury and just go, oh, my mistake. There has been some speculation that Dunch suffered from some kind of left-right dyslexia. To my knowledge, that isn't a thing, but let's say it was. I can tell you as a nurse and having been a surgical patient, there are procedures, protocols, and safeguards set up so that everyone in the operating room knows long before the patient even gets in the operating room, what is the surgical site. Yet, Dunch is known to have operated on one patient on the wrong side of his back. And that tells me it was deliberate. This man is far more sinister than incompetent. He chose to do harm. I think that every time he severed an artery, it was deliberate. And if I'm correct in him being a sadist, then hurting people made him feel good. What I do not think he ever felt? Remorse. What makes the story especially horrifying is that it was almost impossible to stop his thirst for hurting defenseless people. He was a surgeon, and once a patient came into his operating room, he had a green light to open them up, and once inside their body, it seems he just assumed he could do what he wanted and not get caught, which, since many of us are surgical patients now and then, is unbelievably terrifying. Not long ago, I was asked if I thought Christopher Dunch was a serial killer. I say yes. By FBI definition, for an individual to be called a serial killer, they had to have killed three people. We know for a fact two of Dunch's patients died very quickly after leaving the operating room. Others would have died had it not been for the heroic efforts of other physicians in the operating room to save their life. They spend a lot of time prior to the murder fantasizing about it. Eventually, they begin the hunt for the victim. There's a lot of planning and plotting involved, even rehearsing. When the crime happens, they feel tremendous satisfaction for a while. The desire to kill diminishes for a while because they've done it. Then there's a lag time until the next murder. Sometimes that can be days, months, or even years. The staggering number of 32 life-altering or life-threatening injuries and two deaths caused by Christopher Dunch happened in less than 18 months, sometimes as frequently as two to three in a week. That was not an accident. 
Of that, I am certain. Did he fantasize about killing people in the operating room? I don't know. I doubt anyone knows. He's never told anyone that. But he was a serial offender. Why didn't he stop? Even in the face of disclosure by his peers. Because he liked it. We also have proof in the emails that he liked this. He called out his nature in that one email to his former girlfriend. Christopher Dunch was absolutely a serial killer in my mind. His weapon of choice was a scalpel, and he found his victims on the operating room table. At the urging of other doctors in Dallas, the Texas Medical Board finally revoked his license in the winter of 2013. His life began a downward spiral, and in 2015, Dunch was arrested and charged with six felony counts of aggravated assault using a deadly weapon, five counts of aggravated assault causing serious bodily harm, and one count of injury to an elderly person. The trial began in 2017. Ultimately, he was only tried for one of these counts, the injury to an elderly person. That sounds like the least severe, but actually, it was the only first-degree felony with a significant sentence. No doctor had ever been tried for crimes performed in the operating room, so the bar to convict was very high. The prosecution focused on his incompetence. They argued that his advanced education should have made him aware of the damage he was inflicting during each surgery. The first year of medical school, students spend almost that entire time in the classroom or in the lab learning anatomy, working on cadavers. There's no way he would have not recognized an artery, and he did it many, many times. I think he assumed he would not get caught. One of the most damning things of the trial was the cold-blooded killer email. Legally speaking, it spoke to his intent to maim and kill. And in the courtroom, intent is everything. It means what happened was not an accident. Many of his patients gave emotional testimony about the pain and suffering they had endured because of Dr. Christopher Dunch. They also talked about how when they first went to see him, he promised to cure their problem, bragging that he was the best neurosurgeon, not only in Texas, but in all of the Southwest. The trial lasted 13 days. Many people, including his attorney, thought that he seemed uninterested in what was happening, especially with witness testimonies. However, the only time his ears pricked up was when other doctors were describing the disastrous surgeries that took place. The jury took only four hours to find Christopher Dunch guilty for maiming Mary Eford. He was given a life sentence. He won't be eligible for parole until 2045, when he's 74 years old. Christopher Dunch is widely known as Dr. Death. But after everything we've learned, I see him more as Dr. Evil. From Wondery and Treefort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Dana Johnston. Edited by Maxwell Carney. Production manager is Justin Washington. And Haley Mandelberg is our production coordinator. Oscar Guido is the line producer. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marshall Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media.